Okay, there's one little thing I'd like to tell you about how to deal with objects that are undergoing transformations to get from object coordinates to world coordinates through a scene graph. So let's consider that we had some, some kind of sphere in three dimensions. And let's say that this was undergoing some kind of stretching transformation. So I'll make a matrix, I'll call it M, to describe a transformation to take this from object coordinates to world coordinates. So, and let's say that this was a stretching transformation that stretched by a factor of two in the x-axis, but that maybe kept the y-axis fixed like that, and then the z-axis fixed. Um, and of course, I could you know, consider a four by four matrix that applies a tra translation to in homogeneous coordinates, but um, let me stick to a pure um, three by three part for now, because that's all that's gonna matter when I reason about what happens to the normals. So, so this is what I'm gonna try to do now. How do I get the normals right um, under these transformations? So if I look at this, um, if I just look at the geometry of, of the surface, um, let's say you know x is, is left right here. So when I apply this, it's going to stretch it out and turn it into an ellipsoid, right? Actually, maybe just to, to to nail that home, let me just I'll make this look a little more like a sphere in 3D, so we can see see what's happening there. So yeah, I stretch this out, and it turns into an ellipsoid. Okay, great. But what if we let, let's look on the surface of this for a moment? and pick out some point and then let's imagine what the tangent and the normal look like there so so the normal is you know a vector that points straight out and it's it's perpendicular to every tangent well it's perpendicular to the entire tangent plane at at this location so let me maybe I'll just pick one vector in that plane and I'll draw it so I'll call the normal vector n here, and then I'll call the tangent vector t. And I'm not gonna draw the hats over the vector right now just because I don't feel like it. All right. Okay, so let's, so these are perpendicular, right? So, so I picked the normal, by definition, that's perpendicular to the tangent plane of the surface. And I pick some vector t that, that's on the tangent plane. Let's see what happens when I apply this transformation to the normal and the tangent as well. So I go ahead and I stretch this out. And if I look at this, um, these didn't actually remain perpendicular. When I zoom in, suddenly they're making an acute angle. So something went wrong here. That, that's not actually what we want to do. Now, okay, but but it is true though that, that the tangent is still tangent to the surface. You, you can kind of see that. But the normal somehow is is not. And actually, maybe just for a second, I'll look at the normal by itself as I stretch this out more and more. Let's say I went even further. And, and it seems like, so as I'm stretching this out, the normal's kind of going the wrong way. <laughs> like I want the normal almost to, to be increasing its, its slope that way, but it's actually going the other way. And it almost looks like it's, it's yeah, it, it's settling. It's gonna eventually come horizontal, which, which is quite far from um, what the normal direction actually should be here. Okay. So that's not what we want to do. Um, even though we can do it to the tangent or any other point on the surface, we need to do something special for the normal. Okay, so let's talk about what that is. Now, I'm going to go back and think about um, each of these vectors as um, column matrices for a moment, just because that's going to allow me to write this out mathematically in a way that I can can derive what I need to do. So, so the normal is going to be this this three by one matrix, right? And I said, okay, well, if you do this multiplication um, m by n, that that doesn't give you the right thing, okay? Um, but but if you do, actually if you do the multiplication by by m and then you know this this let's say I have a column vector that represents the tangent, um, then, then then that's fine, okay? But um, yeah, but somehow I need to, to come up with a different matrix that I'm going to apply to N, and hopefully I can relate that to the matrix M. It should have something to do with this transformation, um, but it's not going to be the exact same matrix. Okay, now one thing I want to remember is that if two vectors are perpendicular, then the dot product between them is zero. Now I can actually orchestrate um, a a single dot product product out of a matrix multiplication of these two. 
So what I would say is, is that um, the tangent vector um, transpose, so that means I'm going to treat it, I'm going to switch the rows for the columns, or in this case, I'm just going to um, write this as, as a three or a one by three matrix. So the tangent vector transpose um, times the normal vector equals zero. That's, that's what we're saying. So, so this ex expresses the fact that um, you know, the dot product of these two is zero because they're perpendicular. Okay. Um, I can actually now say, all right, there's kind of a similar idea that I can do. So, so I'm looking for this matrix N that when I multiply by N gives me the correct transform normal. Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm running out of space here. Okay. So I'm looking for this matrix, I'll call it big N, okay, to go along with, with big M. And so big N is, is the, the, the thing that I'm seeking here. And so what I could say is, all right, actually, so the transformed tangent, so M times T, that's the transformed tangent, um, transposed, let me get the little transpose up there. So, so the M times tangent is going to be a column vector still, I'll transpose that just like I transpose this one. And if I multiply that by um, n times n, well, if, if this big N is, is doing the correct thing, then that should also be a dot product of zero. Okay, because I want the transformed normal to be perpendicular to the transformed tangent, All right? So this is the equation that we have, and somehow we got to solve for, um, big N there, all right? Now, what, there's one little trick that I have to do here, which, which you learn when, in, in algebra really generally, but then certainly also applies um, to linear algebra with matrices. Um, this, this MT quantity transpose can actually be written as um, T transpose times M transpose. All right, so you, you can convince yourself of this if you write it down in a piece of paper that um, these two multiplications end up being the same thing. So I'm trying to get rid of the transpose around the parentheses there and, and kind of take this out. And now I can write this as just um, T, T transpose, M transpose, um, sorry, T transpose, M transpose, big N, N. All right. So it's just a little matrix trick I did here. Multiplication of matrix times another matrix is the other matrix transpose times the original matrix transpose. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do here is um, put some parentheses around the middle here and say, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so my equation here is this is all supposed to be equal to zero. If I put some parentheses around the middle and I kind of stare at this for a second, what I would say is, all right, this actually is, is starting to look like the original equation I had before the transformation, right? T, T transpose N is equal to zero, except I've got this thing in the middle, right? Now, if I were to say that this thing in the middle was the identity matrix, then I know that, that this is true still because, okay, the identity matrix, uh, that would just be, you know, I can either multiply it by N or I can multiply it by T transpose, this, this three by three identity matrix. And then I would just get this, this original equation again, T, T, um, T transpose n is equal to zero. So if this is the identity matrix, then I'm expressing the original equation, which is which we know is true. So if I can make this the identity matrix, then I'm set. Okay, so let me try to do that. So, so I'm gonna say, all right, m transpose n should be the identity matrix. And now I'm getting very close to being able to solve this. Because all I have to do is isolate um, n by itself. And so what I can do is um, I guess I'll multiply both sides by um, the inverse of the left matrix here, M transpose. So if I multiply both sides on the left by the inverse of M transpose, what I get is that N is equal to M transpose inverse. Because the identity matrix times anything is just that thing. Okay, so turns out <laughs> in terms of the original transformation matrix N, the normal matrix is supposed to be um, M transpose inverse, all right? 
So that's the expression that we use to compute the, the normal matrix. So I might as well just put it up here. here here's the, the magic formula. M transpose inverse. Okay, well, so this matrix um, is a scaling matrix. The transpose, if I switch the rows from the columns here, it's actually the same thing. So the transpose doesn't do anything. But if I look at the inverse of this matrix, the inverse is actually going to scale by the opposite amount in each axis. So y and z axes are the same here, but, but it's saying instead of stretching by a factor of 2, I'm going to compress by a factor of 2. So this, this would actually be um, 0.5. So in this example, the normal matrix would be um, 0 0.500010. 0, 0, 0. So I'll write that down here. <clears throat> so just to show you what, what happens to this, you know, in this particular example that I had drawn here, what it's saying is actually <clears throat> when you go ahead and stretch this thing out by a factor two. Oh, let me pull this along here. When you stretch this out by a factor two. Um, you should actually take the normal and compress it on the x-axis by a factor of two. And you see that when, when I move when I move the normal down, that's what makes it stay perpendicular. So so it actually has to stretch the opposite way in order to stay perpendicular. That that's that's probably the easiest example that I could show here of of why this actually kind of makes sense, why it's somehow related to the inverse of the original matrix, but um, this, this general formula also works for more complicated things like shears. So if you, if you have off diagonal elements, then and this is what you add. Okay. So if I jump into this code here, I can show you something kind of interesting. So I made this library called GG Slack, which sits on top of WebGL and it does basic graphics with scenes and everything. That's what we've been using throughout the whole course. And there's this method inside of the mesh class that I have that sends a whole bunch of stuff to the GPU um, that, that it needs to draw all the triangles of this mesh. One of the things that, that comes along with it is, is this T matrix here. This is uh, the transformation matrix that you get from the seam graph to go from object coordinates to world coordinates. Now, if I look down a little bit, um, so yeah, you send over a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, eventually I get to this section of the code that, that says normal matrix. And I use this method in the uh, geomatrix class to do to compute the normal matrix. Um, and then on the other side, I have these shaders and that comes in here um, as a uniform. And so what happens is, the, the normal that we actually end up using, so, so for example, this is, this is Fong shading, so this is in the fragment shader. But so the normal I actually end up using, I, I apply this normal matrix to the normal in um, object coordinates. And actually, by the way, there's no guarantee that that will remain a unit vector. And so actually, I have to normalize it. So that's one extra thing I need to do too, if, if I'm assuming that this is a unit vector. All right. So, so that's how I have it working in GG Slack. And I did a similar thing in the ray tracing assignment that, that you'll be doing. Um, so you can also do this during ray instancing when you're um, transforming a ray based on, on this, this transformation. And actually, it's probably worth it to, to even maybe look at the source code of, so let's see, yeah, if we go to the MAT3 library in, in Geometrix, yeah, there's this method normal from MAT4. So, yeah, this just looks at the upper three by three part of a transformation matrix because that's all we need to look at for the normal. And um, yeah, it's a little bit hard to see here, but this this should be do, yeah this is going to do the the um, <laughs> it's going to do the inverse of the transpose. Looks like it's probably using something called Kramer's rule to do the inverse. All right, so maybe not so easy to see in the code here, but, but that it is actually just what I showed here. Great, so that's normal matrices. So hopefully that doesn't seem so magical anymore and, and you can actually see why we're doing what we're doing. Right, there's one more thing I want to point out that's kind of interesting. So if the transformation matrix that takes us from uh, object coordinates to world coordinates, M, is a pure rotation, then actually the normal matrix is going to be M. It's going to be the exact same. So let me show you here if, if I start to rotate these. You can kind of see, right, that they visually it kind of makes sense. 
that they stay perpendicular. Um, but mathematically, it makes sense too, because if you remember a rotation matrix, if I go back to this whole thing with the gimbals where I was showing, um, a rotation matrix can be thought of as a matrix where um, each column of the matrix, so let me, let me show the columns here. Uh, each column of the matrix is a vector that tells me how to get to, to one of the new axes. So the first column is the new x-axis, the second column is the new y-axis, and the third column is, is the new z-axis. So as, you know, as I choose different rotations, those columns change. But, but the whole time, the, these axes stay mutually perpendicular. All right? so, so this remains as a right-handed coordinate system where each axis is perpendicular to every other axis. So if I think about that and, and what this equation here is telling me, um, so that's like saying, okay, so M I'm going to define as this matrix where um, the first column is like, you can think of, I'll call it vector X here. Um, second column is vector Y and third column is vector Z. And so these take up an entire column. So let me just depict that real quick. All right, so there's my matrix M if it's a rotation matrix. And so then M transpose is gonna be the same thing, except each one of these becomes a row instead of a column. So let me go ahead and I'll just take these and rotate them by 90 degrees. Okay, so here's my transpose matrix and here's the original matrix. And if I look at the multiplication of the two of them together, what I'll see is Okay, first element here is gonna be first row of M transpose times first column of M. So that'd be X dot X, and that, that's actually one because these are unit vectors. That's another thing about a, a pure rotation matrix with no scaling. Each one of these columns is a unit vector. So that's one. Um, if I look at X dot Y though, that's zero because each of these is mutually perpendicular, right? So that's gonna be one, zero, and for the same reason, X dot Z is gonna be zero. And so what you see, you keep doing this. Okay, so, so next, first element of the second row um, is gonna be y dot x, and, and that's a zero. Second element of the second row is gonna be y dot y, that's actually a one, because y dot itself is, is one, because y is a unit vector, and, and zero. And so, so we, we go through this whole exercise and we get the identity matrix. So what that tells us, and, and the same thing would happen if you put this m on the other side. So what this is telling us is that M, M transpose is a two-sided inverse of, of M, if M is a rotation matrix. So this is really, again, saying M transpose is M inverse. Take the inverse again, I get M back. So M transpose is the inverse, and so therefore um, the normal end matrix ends up being the same thing. So just to show you an example of this, I'll show you an example in 2D because the same th thing applies. Let's say that I had created a matrix that um, rotates this thing 45 degrees counterclockwise. So I'll do that like this. Um, so there you go, looks like it's, oh, sorry, that was out of view there, there we go. Here's the matrix that multiplies as 45 degrees counterclockwise. And then if I make this the first column, or let me see, let me see, I make this first column here be the first row. So I make this 0 0.701, 0 0.701. And then I make the second column be the second row, negative 0 0.701, 0 0.701. What I should see is, is the, the inverse of this. So a matrix that goes 45 degrees clockwise instead of counterclockwise. And so just to show you, I do one after the other and I get the identity matrix. Okay, cool. So, so just again, to summarize, um, rotation is a special case where you don't have to worry about it. Uh, the normal matrix is the same, but as soon as you introduce any shearing or stretching, uh, then, then you have to do something different. Okay, cool. Uh, one more thing. So sometimes you'll see this actually written in a slightly different way. You'll see it written as um, the transpose of M inverse. So you switch the where the inverse is and where the transpose is. And actually these, just to say, these two are identical. All right, so I'm not gonna prove that right here, but um, yeah, sometimes you'll see it written this way and that's the same thing. Okay, very good.